This is I Hear Things for Friday, October 29th, the crux of the kerfuffle. I've always wanted to use kerfuffle in a headline, and there it is. So a couple of things this week. First of all, I wanted to update a number that we haven't put out in a while, the percentage of weekly podcast listeners who listen to at least one truly independent podcast every week. And here I'm talking about podcasts that basically write their own paychecks. They're not part of a large network. I had the pleasure of presenting this new data at the X Fronts yesterday, which was a, a wonderful showcase of independent podcasts. And I thought I'd share the kind of the big number here with you. So this is from our podcast consumer tracker data uh, from the rolling four quarter average from the period that ended uh, on June 30th of this year. It's a sample of 8,000 weekly listeners. And we asked people uh, basically in the podcast tracker, they write down every podcast that they've listened to in the last week. And we use our massive algorithm machine, but it's the good algorithm, not, not the Facebook one, uh, to match all of that to the correct name of the show, to match it to the producer, match it to advertising representation, all of that. So we have a complete picture of the space. And we queried that data to find out the percentage of weekly podcast consumers who listen to at least one independent podcast in the last week. And that number was 49%. And if you project that out, which we can because we weight it to our infinite dial data, that 49% of all weekly podcast listeners equates to roughly 39 million Americans. I think that's a pretty cool number. It's cool because it's big. Uh, it's cool because it hasn't changed uh, all that much in the last four quarters. And also because the underlying demographics of indie listeners are almost identical to the demographics of podcast listeners in general, which means they aren't really different to those listeners who do not listen to indie podcasts. In other words, though the podcasts be weird and wonderful and niche, or as the French would say, niche, the audience is big, it's mainstream, and they buy the same mattresses and underwear that everyone else does. I hope to do a deeper dive into this segment of the podcast audience uh, soon. I will hopefully will be able to look at those who mostly or maybe even only listen to independent podcasts. So stay tuned for that a little bit down the road. On to our next topic. On Wednesday of this week, Spotify announced that they were the number one platform that U.S. podcast listeners use the most. And they cited data from our podcast consumer tracker as evidence of that. I spent the better part of that day fielding press inquiries about this data, which were polite and professional, and I think represented everything really, really well and also not fielding some of the more indecorous reactions that I saw on social media. I had a longer podcast plan to tackle this topic because I think it's important for the podcast industry to get their head around how this could be so when Apple, by everyone's account, is leading Spotify in downloads. Uh, luckily, the editor of Pod News, James Cridlin, did a very good job spelling a lot of this out uh, in his analysis on Spotify uh, from Thursday's edition of Pod News, and I'll link to that in the show notes. But here's the crux of the kerfuffle that I observed on Twitter and whatever the heck Facebook is. Um, more on that a little bit later. How can Apple and Spotify both be number one? And in parentheses, when we all know Apple is. Well, here's the short answer. They both sit atop very different ladders. If you want to measure downloads, Apple has been and continues to be the leader in downloads. But the Spotify platform is preferred by more people. Now, I'm not making a value judgment either way about which claim is objectively better. And by the way, both are clients. My only motivation here is to foster understanding. I'm merely saying that these claims are objectively different and true. Apple surely leads in downloads. They've been around longer. They have listeners with longer time in service to podcasting. And we know from our podcast consumer tracker measurements that the longer you've been a podcast listener, the more shows you're likely to listen to and collect over time. That generates downloads. We see this in our data all the time. If you're someone who prefers the Apple Podcast app or Apple Podcast apps, anything in the ecosystem, you generate more downloads. But more people prefer the Spotify app, which is the claim that they can credibly make. Now, the data they based this on is not a shock to you. In fact, it came from this very newsletter, and I'll quote back to that in the show notes. And I also presented it at Podcast Movement just a few months ago. 
in the most recent podcast consumer tracker report, which again averages 8,000 weekly podcast listeners for uh, the four quarters ending this last June 30th, 24% say that Spotify is the service they use the most, and 21% say Apple Podcasts. So fewer people say they use Apple the most, but those people generate a lot more downloads, and maybe three times more, maybe even more than that. We don't know. And we don't know because no one is measuring the whole download space. Not Edison, no one. But Spotify is indeed currently number one in preference. And that's it. It's that simple. Both are true and both easily can be true. In fact, although Spotify's ascension to the top of the preferred list may seem recent, it's actually been a trend for several quarters, the last three or four. It was simply the quarter two report that put them over the top in a four quarter average. So it wasn't a shock to us. It wasn't a shock to our subscribers. And if you think about it, why wouldn't Spotify ascend to the top of that list? Unlike Apple podcasts, Spotify is truly cross platform. They've also invested in some very popular shows and made them exclusive. It is in fact, this very latter popularity that Spotify has been aiming to sit atop, and they've done it different to Apple. Spotify has increased the reach of podcasting, and Apple continues to profit from frequency. This is a battle as old as major media-rated time itself. Now, back to the Bruhaha, which I think was a terrible Starship album. For those who did indeed conflate app preference for download figures, their initial impulse was to challenge the press release. Not to do so would be either to admit that you were surprised by this, and humans on social media really hate to do this, or that you didn't see it coming. Humans on social media really, really hate to do this. So for the record, here are the three most common objections that I heard about the Spotify news. Number one, they manipulated the data. I think we've established that the data was correctly characterized. It's just different, right? It's not downloads. Number two, it's only survey data. Now, when you ask one simple question like this to a sample of 8,000 persons in a properly sampled survey, you could repeat that same survey in the same time frame and get an answer that is plus or minus 1%, 99% of the time. And by the way, most business decisions are made at a much higher margin of error and generally at the 95% confidence interval, but I wanted to show off a little. If you can sample the entire pot of soup, the whole pot of soup of everything podcasting as we can, and that soup is stirred properly, you only need one spoonful to know if it's too salty, and two spoonfuls will taste almost identical. We stir that soup really well, and if you don't like bragging, you can turn off for the next 10 seconds. I mean, The industry has been relying and profiting on our data for 16 years now. So it's not only survey data. It's, I think it's exceptional survey data. So let's leave that. But number three, it doesn't look anything like our data, or it doesn't look anything like someone else's data. Now, this is the sticky one. I've just spent eight minutes on the fact that it isn't download data and looks nothing like download data. But also at the heart of this objection is a concept that I have to take some uh, responsibility for this. I have personally failed so far at teaching to digital marketers. And that's this concept, non-response bias. I'm going to try it again. So here's an example of this sort of thing uh, using what I assume is Libsyn data. It was tweeted by someone from Libsyn uh, who tweeted uh, sort of in in defiance of of the Spotify news. Apple Podcasts is clearly number one at around 60% of downloads, and Spotify is a respectable number two at 15%. So let's do some quick discounting to these numbers uh, based, again, on some work that James Cridlin has done, which I will, uh, again, link to in the show notes. You can lop off about a third of those Apple downloads as automatically downloaded but not listened to, or confounded by the fact that some non-Apple services represent themselves as the Apple Core Media user agent, which kind of confounds your data. So if you lop off about a third of those downloads, which I think is right, rebase that share pie from, uh, from that Libsyn data, uh, 
And it's more like 50% Apple, 19% Spotify, and 31% the rest. So that ratio, 50 to 19, that's perfectly reasonable given everything that we've talked about so far. Apple could certainly have two to three, even four, uh, four times more downloads, plays, listens than Spotify, and Spotify could still be the most popular platform. So there's nothing in that data at all that invalidates or even confounds the popularity data that Spotify is referring to. But the real issue here is what we statisticians would call the non-response bias of data, uh, like the data that I just presented to you that's uh, from the hosting company. To go back to my soup analogy, while we have access to the entire pot, well stirred, evenly distributed, we can only look at a small spoonful. That, of course, is the limitation of survey data. Now, looking at the data from your hosting provider or even one of the download trackers that the industry has at its disposal, you have access to much more than a spoonful, but not the whole pot. So while hosting data looks impressive because it's likely millions or billions of fields in a database that might return several cups or a quart of that soup, it could be two cups of potatoes or two cups of beans or where all the salt is hiding. You don't know because you have no way of stirring and sampling the whole soup, only your ingredients. When you don't know what you don't know, you don't know. And that's non-response bias. Now, none of this is to denigrate the data that you get from hosting providers or download trackers. Their data is perfect for what it is. But that data should not be used to denigrate survey data either. Neither one gets you the whole truth, and neither one can. John Spurlock at Livewire analyzed everything over the month of September, and he found that no tracking service covered more than 4% of new episodes released. Libsyn hosts less than 2% of the podcasts that are listed in podcastindex.org. Projecting that data to all of podcasting would be kind of like, actually exactly like allowing Minnesota to elect the president. Yeah, I did the math on that. All of these sources can provide near-perfect information about their particular ingredients of the soup, but no single source can give you the whole soup as far as downloads are concerned. And while surveys can give you what the whole soup does taste like, it can't give you the exact details of every ingredient like a download measure can. Surveys and download measures are not farmers and cowmen. It takes a village. At the risk of being pedantic, I will close with one last example. Suppose you were tasked with finding out how many Americans drank at least one beer in a restaurant last night. This, by the way, if you're applying for a job at McKinsey, that's a great interview question. Now, to answer that, one approach, I could execute a survey of 2,000 recent restaurant goers, people who went to a restaurant last night, and ask them that simple question, did you have a beer? I would get an answer here. I could also ask how many and what brands, and I would get an answer there as well, although the quantity figure might be understated because, well, alcohol. And my estimate there would be pretty good. It would be repeatable, but it would not give you detail on every brand of beer. At some level of resolution of craft beers and, and even some of the larger uh, major breweries, it would kind of fall off and I wouldn't be able to give you that kind of detail. But my estimate would be good. In contrast, you could also gain access to every single sales receipt from, say, Red Robin. Yum. Now, you'd have perfect data from every order from every Red Robin in the country on that night. You could report in great detail how many of each brand of beer was sold in a Red Robin, and the level of detail and specificity there would be significantly higher than you would see in the survey. But could you use Red Robin as a proxy for the whole industry? No. Red Robin is generally built around kids and family. If you've eaten there, you can see that. The same people who might have four beers at B-dubs on a Tuesday night are not getting sloshed at Timmy's birthday party. Maybe they'll get sloshed on those bottomless plywood planks that they call fries, but not on beer. So you don't know what you don't know. And just like 5 million Red Robin slips won't tell you a thing about beers they don't sell, none of the download tracking data can really tell you about Spotify when Joe Rogan, 
Armchair Expert, Collar Daddy, and other exclusives aren't even on their menu. The space is changing, friends. Newer and younger podcast listeners are choosing different platforms than older veteran listeners. It's happening. Some of the biggest podcasts in the world have been taken off the counting table, and that includes the biggest one. But that doesn't mean listeners aren't still listening. It's easier just to disregard or challenge this data than to admit this has been going on for months and I've missed it. This has been going on for months. Finally, a, a quick meta take. We've all had our laugh about Facebook changing their name to meta, myself included. I couldn't resist a tweet or two. If uh, holding companies like Anthem and Unum merged and became Unthum or Anum or Unum or Auntie M, no one would care. But Zuck got everyone talking about meta. So maybe not such a dumb name. Mission accomplished. I'll close with three and a half things to consider. Number one, remember that no one calls Google Alphabet in everyday speech. Sometimes this stuff just doesn't matter. Number two, the site, the app, the service, whatever, will still be Facebook. We researchers will still call it Facebook. Journalists will still call the service Facebook. So why talk about a holding company? They want you to use Meta. You don't have to use Meta. Number three, if your vocation or your passion involves the metaverse, maybe change the name. You don't have to call persistent augmented reality spaces the metaverse. We're not even in the first inning of that game. That's how we got stuck with Kleenex and Xerox. If only the company Meta calls it the metaverse, then it just sounds goofy, like their annual conference, instead of us having to say their name every time we talk about an, an important concept. And finally, number 3.5. You never have to say meta again if you don't want to, unless you are constipated. And this podcast has been brought to you by Meta Musil. All that for a cheap laugh. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, have a fantastic week. I will be back uh, probably in two weeks. I'm taking next weekend off to go to a football game with my son. Uh, as always, you can support the show at buyacoffee.com slash Tom Webster. Please share, subscribe. Smash the imaginary button in your head. And I really appreciate you listening. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. I'm Tom Webster for I Hear Things. We'll see you next time. 